Yeah. It's literally the coolest place I've ever been in, I think. <laughs> Don't say it. Wait, save that. Oh. Wait, wait, I gotta hype you up. All right, all right. This is how people talk. Let me put a hat on. All right, we'll go with, we'll go with Enforce today. I'm gonna put a hat on today, guys, before I get to the intro. I know you're all listening. Hang on. All right. We're back with another episode. First, the sponsors. Head over to www.john Bartolo Show. Go check out a complete list of the sponsors there. I want to thank a few of them now. Sig Sauer, Gallo Technology, Rhino Metals, Blackwater Ammunition, Pulsar Thermal Imaging Technology, Volkortzen Firearms, and of course, Kenzie's Optics, Galco Leather Holsters. Appreciate all you guys. Every brand, everybody that supports the show. Can't thank you guys enough. I got a guy in, I, I got a guy in today I, I, I've admired from afar from, for a while. We're going to get to him and his story. He's got a very cool company, and I want to ask him a whole bunch of questions. He's in an industry I love. We think we all grew up loving, I hope. Uh, and it's the ultimate industry in terms of being more capable because it all starts here. We got the one and only Bark Kwan from Barbell Brigade. Hey, what's, what's up, going everyone? on, brother? How's it going? How are you? Good. This is literally the coolest place I've ever been in in my life, I think. <laughs> no, this is like um, Jesus if Christ. Batman had a recording studio. I feel like this is would be like the, the cave, the cave, you know, mm -hmm. it's is it like cave, like, um, like the dark Knight series or the cave, like the old TV show, <laughs> the janky as fuck. <laughs> wow. Oh, no, the, the dark Knight for sure. Dark Knight for sure. I appreciate that, man. I've always kind of admired you from afar and I was glad when, uh, a few mutual friends connected us and connected the dots. Cause I didn't know you were living here. You had recently moved, right? I just moved here like five, six months ago. Amazing. You like it? I fucking love, love it so it. far, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's crazy, right? And you got into a business everybody had to think you were fucking nuts to get into in the first place, right? I mean... Like the fitness industry? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was loaded when you got in, and you built a fantastic brand. What the hell were you thinking? Honestly, I don't think me... So I built with my wife. Right. And I don't think we knew at all what we're doing. So we're, I'm actually... I, actually <laughs> I came, love the honesty. No, I actually came in from, like, the comedy space. So we did uh, two channels, one called Just Kidding Films, which mm -hmm. is sketch comedy, one called Just Kidding News, which is a comedic talk show sure. that we did for, I think, maybe six or seven yeah, years. Yeah, a while. I saw some of it. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, in the comments, people are always like, oh, like, share your training programs or, or teach me how to lift and all that. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I like to train my ass off, but I don't know jack shit about <laughs> training or lifting or whatever like that. It's awesome. So I was like, how about this? I'll start a YouTube channel where I'll just, people can like watch how I train and not necessarily me give any advice, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was doing that and I was just doing kind of like the typical like strength and conditioning stuff that I learned in the military because I was a Marine and uh, some stuff that we did in wrestling and then just a lot of different bodybuilding splits that I would find in like Muscle and Fitness magazine sure. like by Jay Cutler, Ronnie Coleman, Brett sure. Warren, like yeah. all those guys, right? And um, I did MMA for a little bit um, and I kind of just missed the competitive aspect of it because I wrestled in high school, like that kind of stuff. Sure. I kind of missed, like, you know, being in a team and doing that kind of stuff. So I looked up, I wonder if there's any strength competitions because I'm like, I think I'm pretty strong for my weight in my gym. So I didn't even know what powerlifting was. Right. I just looked up, like, strength competition. <laughs> and this thing called powerlifting popped up. And I'm like, what's powerlifting? I clicked on it and it said, you compete in the squat, bench, and the deadlift. Full power. Full power. And I'm like, okay, so I bench and deadlift because I'm such a bro. Mm -hmm. I've never squatted before. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So I'm like, I think I can, if I can do two out of the three, I sh should be fine. Right. So I just signed up for it. And then uh, I competed. And I, the first time I've ever squatted without looking at a squat rack was at the competition oh my god so my first attempt i come out there and i'm like oh wait there's no it's all backwards yeah there's no mirror what the hell's going on i squat and the whole thing kind of just shifts because you're used to using the mirror as cues sure you hear the entire audience go oh almost as if like a baseball player broke his arm or something i didn't even think of this but this is keep going this is good yeah so i'm like oh, oh, oh my god this, i hope he's okay and then um and that in those days like traditional powerlifting now, you have three attempts to hit your highest max. So yep. Usually you go, you kind of scale up, you know, yep. something you're going to get in the bag, a little bit heavier, a little bit heavier. Back then, I was such a bro. I thought you literally just chose the hundred percent that you can go and you just try to nail it three times. So even the first one, it was kind of like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and then so finally, some guy that's really seasoned pulled me aside and he's like, I can tell from your squad attempts, you're not choosing good ones. So he kind of just helped me on my bench build a flight yeah build a flight on my deadlift and uh i just fell in love with the sport 
and so when I came back to LA to like compete at Camp Pendleton, mm. uh, I came back to LA and I'm like, you know what? I need to find myself a powerlifting gym. Right. And I couldn't find one. Mm. So uh, me and a couple of other buddies I lifted with, I was like, you know, we do have our comedy uh, office. What if I just buy one of those containers, park it in the back? Because it's, it's in like a flex space, like half sure. warehouse, half office space, where like some of the parking p- spaces are. Kind of like this, yeah. Yeah, they are like 40 feet long. Mm-hmm. So I'll get one of those 20, 40 foot containers. Drop we'll, it in there. Yeah, we'll chip in all kinds of money. And then we'll, we'll, we'll have like our own little legit crazy setup. And just by me texting a bunch of people, I got like 20 people that are like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And I'm like, holy shit, if I can get 20 people like overnight, I wonder how many. This is bigger. Yeah. I'm like, how many people can I get like in a week or in a month? You know? So I was starting to get, oh, shit, this is kind of crazy. Yeah. So me and my wife, two idiots from the comedy <laughs> space, <laughs> we go to Barnes and Noble and we're like, okay, this, is, this requires a business plan. So we, we go to the business book and we're just sitting on the floor with like, 10 books open like which one is for us which one's for us because we've built businesses online but not a brick and mortar you know we're going to serve the public and all that and there was this one book that had uh worksheets at the back of each chapter so you kind of just fill it out and then i think there was like i don't know 10 to 15 chapters and by the time you're done you have, you have a, a, plan. a business plan yeah so we just did that and we did that in our spare time and then we started doing all the stuff like you go to the city for this zoning and the permits and whatever. Mm. And we just did every single step. And then we ended up at like two guys or two people from the com the YouTube comedy world end up opening, I would say probably LA's first powerlifting gym all just by like accident. Right. And kind of just one foot in front of the other without even knowing where the hell we were going. What I love about that story, though, is is you're humble enough to say, like, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And oh. everybody likes to say, like, they know everything, and that's what aggravates me. Yeah. I, I know you're not one of those guys, but it, you you just literally laid out my life, a lot of guys, you know? Because <laughs> yeah. like, you don't have an idea what you're doing, you yeah. know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, and people yeah. try to play it off like, bro, I had it figured out from day one. No, no you way. don't. No way. And you make every mistake. You, there's mistakes in here. We, we've made them, and there's plenty of things. But if you have a concept and you have an idea, if you follow the, the, the steps, the yellow brick road, no pun intended, you can get to having a business. Whether or not it's a good business model is a whole nother story, but you can get to that point, and that's... Yeah. You know, you have to have the humbleness to know you're going to make mistakes, the humility. Yeah. Because you will. Yeah. No one knows what the hell they're doing. Even uh, one of my biggest business mentors, he started Hurley with his friend and they were a ginormous business sold to Nike. Yeah. Right? He told me when he first heard of Uber, he thought it was the dumbest fucking idea in the Ever. world. And then he was like, like in my face, you know? Yeah. There, I, there was something. I don't know the story. I don't know if it was Gary V. I think it was Gary V. He passed on something with Uber or somebody passed on something. A lot of people pass on things initially because they can't see the monetization of it. That's the thing. And that's why a lot of people I feel end up in like clothing, traditional stuff, food and beverage, because they can see the monetization of it. When it's digital, sometimes it gets a lot harder for people to understand. Well, how? Because Facebook was like that for a while. People like, how is Facebook going to make money? And everybody's like, ad revenue. And they're like, that much? And it's like, (laughs) oh, it's billions to be it'll be trillion soon yeah. and that metaverse is going to be something insane and and that's why you know this it's so hard arguing with anybody over 55 right now because they just can't see it or wrap their head around it it's so hard yeah at all or even like just the new things that are popping up all the time like from airbnbs to now like cryptocurrency mm-hmm. like nfts and like the metaverse like you're saying it's just crazy where the world is going and how quickly like things are adapting is just nuts it's nuts it is insane now you realize you have something and you start building barbell brigade and it's what i liked about it and you brought up the veteran thing and it's an understated thing it's not you don't live in that realm anymore kind of like a lot of the guys i know that are very successful businessmen you kind of you know move on and form your own identity and develop your own brand independent of that uh do you do you look at companies that bang on the veteran thing as a mistake or do you see it as a positive or how does that make you feel when guys are like that's their whole brand identity i think it all depends on uh whatever is the most natural and most authentic to them so i think there's people that are like for me um it's, it's part of my identity, but I, that's also, I mean, I got out in 2009, 
So since then, I think I've almost gone. I mean, I've almost done a, a hundred eighty reversal from a very like macho and right to me being a clown wearing women's clothes doing sketch comedy so like since then i've done so much other things that it, it becomes kind of like one of the chapters in my life sure rather than like i was the first the grade. defining moment yeah i'm not a handball champion from first grade and that's who i am you know mm -hmm. but uh, I also see like in some of my closest friends, even from my old unit, where that was their identity, even probably even before they joined, you know, they've always a lot of veterans have an interesting take on this. That's why I wanted to hear yours. Yeah. Some people they're like, I've been like uh, one of my closest buddies. He's a detective for um, the L.A. Sheriff's Department. Now, when we were wrestling in high school, his name was already the Marine. Right. You know, he was already this Oakley wearing G Shock wearing dude, tied his shoelaces a hundred percent tight wherever yeah, he went. Pants into the boots. Exactly. Yeah. Like that was already him. So I think for, for people, um, whether the, there's the name or not, they've already kind of lived and breathed that. So yeah. to me, it's like if that's you, then just do you because I, I can relate to you. But also, if that's just one chapter in your life, I think that's cool too. Do you feel like it benefits you to move on from it quicker or do you, cause Tony's really good about it too. Real yeah. world tactical. And yeah, I know he's yeah. a mutual friend of ours. He's really good about it. It doesn't define him, but it's who he is. And he's very good at integrating that integrate integrating that into his program. I think a lot of guys do get too held up on it and yeah. they make it a huge part of their, their business and their livelihood. And it sometimes affects how they do business. Cause they always want to have that label. And I think it limits your market. Yeah, I do. I do too. Um, so for me, I think I've learned a lot of lessons from it, like discipline, um, structure, being able to push yourself, um, accomplishing the mission at all costs. So I think there's certain things that I've taken from it and I've used that to build like our comedy company, our fitness company. Mm. But I think those two things also have its own soul and its own life. So it's not like, I like that veteran ran comedy. That already sounds funny. You know? Yeah. Some guys bang on it a little hard. And I was always curious because I, I know uh, your background and I, I understand it, but you've never banged on it hard. And that's, that's something that I think is, is a good tactic, especially in the things you're trying to break into because you want everybody to spend money. Yeah. You know, you don't want to just pigeonhole. It does help if you're in a niche and it helps in that niche and you can really bang on it. Yeah. But I think it can pigeonhole you and other things and i think or you're right part of the story yeah like, uh black rifle coffee yeah like he was doing coffee back out in afghanistan so and I it think, makes sense yeah so to me if it's part of the story then i would say definitely double down on it but um i wouldn't say just arbitrarily use that to identify who you are or what your company amen is. And, the, and the black rifle guys have even evolved in a, in a in a good way too in so many ways they got out of that kind of that bro vets yeah. you know space a little bit and started you know getting it into more of being true coffee guys i mean they are a coffee company and they show that in their media and i think that that's commendable they've been evolving a little bit away from some of the theatrics which is good now onto this topic because it's very important i wanted to get with you on this it's it's opportunistic timing unfortunately bad timing recently sean roden passed away i saw yeah yeah terrible we've been losing a lot of bodybuilders and fitness icons and guys dropping gals too dropping like flies what is going on i don't know because i um i mean my own assumption and this can be probably some like the most ignorant assumption um but I do see that there is a lot of health-related issues, especially in the more performance enhancement drug space. It's lifestyle. Lifestyle, right? And, you know, guys that are on gear, on steroids, they have to get regularly tested and have to test for cholesterol, like uh, lipids in their blood. There's, like, a lot of things that come with the price of being that jacked or being at that uh, that yeah. much of the forefront of whatever their sport they're in i personally have never taken any of that stuff or have gone through that process so i don't know what it takes but from anecdotal stories i mean i've heard of people taking things their health is there is just as as much as they've gotten jacked their health has deteriorated just as much and mm. if they're not like really stringent on their diet you know, whatever fat consumption that you have can be times 10. And some of the, I think, is it growth, human growth hormone? Your organs can grow. You know, some of them you, you cause like placking in, in, in like heart areas. So a lot of the, the guys and girls that have uh, passed away or have seen um, health issues are have very similar 
like diseases. Mm. You know? Yeah. One of the things I want to be clear with the audience is that the guys and gals we're talking about at the highest levels. And, you know, I, I hope to get Jay Cutler on at some point to talk about it as well. They're at, it, what Bart says, they're at the highest levels. They're taking insulin. They're taking growth hormone. They're taking stuff that even the casual gym guy is not going to take in many ways. And, and I think you'd agree with that. But whatever is going into their body, whatever the cocktail, whether it's the, the vaccination or it's COVID or something going around, I mean, they're not getting sick. They're dying. Yeah. I mean, and also the guys at the highest level, if they can get even 1% on each other, half a percent, point they'll do it. 1%, yeah, they'll, do it. they'll do it. So they're pushing levels to the extreme. They're pushing their training to the extreme, their diet, their lifestyle to the extreme. Everything is to the extreme. So if you run like a, a race car, you know, mm. on race fuel and it's, it's, it's tough. It's hard for your body to, to hang on. Yeah. And, and some of these guys, I mean, they're not like going to the hospital on a ventilator. I mean, they're just dying. And, yeah. and that's that's the scariest part of it. And I do think it has a lot to do with lifestyle. And I think that's a huge variable. And I think people do dismiss it. We're not talking about the guy that's casually taking some TRT or anything like that. They, these are guys messing around with insulin and everything else. And it's dangerous. And I do think that maybe the, the COVID has something to do with it, whether they got the shot, whether they got sick, but it, it has been known to affect hearts. And these people are just dropping their tickers just stopping so it's, it's a scary time right now in the fitness business and we've lost a lot of shows too because of it or had these shows that have been chopped down olympia arnold yeah kind of wild yeah they put the olympia in florida this year mm -hmm. right they didn't what they didn't open it to the public it was more of a just a stage show and judging and that was really it can bodybuilding survive in its culture in terms of the shows i don't know i mean that's not something i'm like super in uh, when I've, what I've noticed is, so I came into the fitness space through the non-traditional route, which is through like YouTube and social media. And I already started to see a cultural change, a shift. Yeah. Like, cause I would go to the Arnold or Olympia and, and traditionally they'll have like keynote speakers, you know, like legends in the game. And you'll see like, um, two time, three time, Mr. Olympia is giving a speech and the, the seats may not be that full, empty, but you'll see like an Instagram guy or a girl and the, the line is out the entire the convention center, you know? So um, I don't know. I do think it's an old model. And in this day and age, we're witnessing almost every single model shift from taxi and Uber to hotels and Airbnb, even including fitness. So I do think everything is going to get revolutionized at some point. But if the industry can adapt, then it'll just kind of like you know, mold into one. Yeah. I think, I think the social media thing was huge because when I was, when I was on the scene a little bit training at a, at a high level with a lot of these guys, what I found was that the shows, they were just stale and they turned into like t-shirt and shaker bottle type shows. Like that was what everybody went to buy. That was what everybody did. And I'm saying to myself, this, this model can't last. You're charging 50 or 75 bucks at the door and I'm here to buy a t-shirt and a shaker bottle and you can't even see the main show or anything. And I'm like, Who's going to sign up for this long term? And I get it. You know, people at the end of the day want to compete and they want to compete for pro cards and all that. But I think the way it's going to shift is because there's just not the sponsorship dollars in being a champion anymore or being a multi-time champion. I look at people like Dana Lynn and what they've been able to do winning one time and then, you know, becoming more of a personality. And I think what you came, the door you came in is going to be the traditional way going forward. It's not to say being Mr. Olympia is not going to mean anything, but I think it's becoming more of a lifestyle sport. Yeah, and I think um, with everything, right, at the end of the day, if, if you want to make the big bucks, it has to grow outside of the niche you're in and into the entertainment space. Yeah. So even sports, if you're, if you're a boxer or if you're a sprinter, you want to get into sports entertainment. And if it's in the entertainment realm, then you have to reach the public. So social media, I think, is definitely going to play a huge role in it. Huge. My old Muay Thai coach, um, he was saying that, like, in terms of rankings – uh, he was offered a spot to the UFC, but he'll get beat out by a guy that has like 50,000 followers. Of course. You know, so it's like, you know, if you if you have all these candidates in front of you, your fight record, which used to be good enough, is not no longer good enough. You need your social media. You need everything. I think I think it's starting to shift in the job market, too, because people know who people can reach based on following and based on who follows them and what's all involved. So you can't go into a job interview and have Harvard and expect it to be automatic anymore yeah you know what's crazy is so when i came from the youtube comedy space um back in the day i would because i knew what my strengths were when i did do auditions on my headshot i would put like instagram and like yeah. youtube 
And that was smart. Some, that was something that the casting agents, I don't think they recognize the power of it yet. So they would just look at it and they go, okay, cool. And they kind of consider me with whatever. But now when you go in, you might even bomb an audition, but they're like, whoa, a million followers. I think we need this guy in our movie. Do you think, Bart, because, that, that, because mainstream media is dying, they need the lift from social? I think... Uh, like, what are those backroom conversations? Are they like, I don't know, man. That chick had a million fall. Like, you think there's that going on? So I think... So there's a couple of things going on. Um, what we're seeing with social media and TV is what we've seen with TV and movies in the past. So back in the day when there was just the movie industry, when people started owning personal TVs in their house, um, they were like, you know what? Instead of replaying the movies that we have, I think we need to shoot uh, content. Or they didn't call it content back then, but I think we need to show, shoot shows specifically for this platform right. in the living room where the families get together. <laughs> and... Um, and back then there was kind of like this TV versus movie fight. Mm. And then they kind of all became one giant machine. And you have like stars that are in movies as well as TV shows. And they'll even have TV cuts for movies. And But we always understood that there was a slight uh, underproduction in the TV Quality. side of things. Yeah. Until like we get these giant shows like Game of Thrones or whatever, mm -hmm. Ozarks, you know, these guys, they're pretty much movie quality. The scale's now. pretty fucking nuts, yeah. Yeah, it's like the same as a, a movie now. And now I think we're seeing the same thing where... People, they already saw that. So they're like, okay, we got to swallow up these social media people as fast as we can because it's all about eyeballs and numbers at the end of the day. The problem is that a lot of the social media people, you'll see that when they get bet on by the studios and they do actually have a budget, but because they don't have that 10-year acting experience, the quality of those long-form content isn't as good. But I think that, that'll be the next wave. The next wave, we're going to see people that are training and acting or whatever they're doing just as much as their social media. Right. And, and you're going to see people with big followings mm. and also really good, like on the screen. I agree. I think, I think it's going to continue to, to evolve because I think production cost of producing something like even this studio you mentioned on this scale 10 years ago no one could have imagined this like it was yeah. you know this is not a, like I, I joke all the time it's not a podcast down in, in my mother's basement but like it's it's to div get this type of product prices have to come down it has to be affordable you have to have access you have to be able to have the technology to pull it off but now someone can stream nationwide literally via youtube nationwide and they don't have to pay anything for it. And the quality is insane. I yeah. can hear it through these headphones. Yeah, it's it's a next level thing. And people don't realize that, I think, when they're talking about media. I can go on YouTube right now and with the right hashtags, have something that a million people will see. And I think it took a long time before CNN, Fox, ABC, MSNBC, NBC got scared of that. Yeah. And I think they started to get scared. And that's where they started coming in and saying exactly what you said. We need to get these social media people. We need to start develop streaming. I mean, streaming is getting cutthroat. People are buying people out like left and right. Yeah. Peacock bought what? WWE or something like that. Wow. It was just, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's getting crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. You see, uh, and you also see the amount of power that these modern day like influencers slash celebrities have now. Like when Elon Musk uh, smoked a little bit of weed on Joe Rogan, dipped just one a little hit. bit. Yeah, one had dipped, and then or like Kim Kardashian or someone in her family can talk shit or something, and you know something will tank. Or the other way, where they can say something and then like shares of a stock skyrocket. So in this day and age, it's almost like uh, your clout is your power. And that's even more powerful than whatever your authority is in whatever space you're in, you know? I think, yeah, I think, I think right now any news is good news, right? Like, I think if you can get press around your name, we've seen everybody come back. Even Michael Vick came back. I mean, <laughs> we've seen it all. So I think if you can, you know, barring conviction of a crime, I think most people, you know, can get a, a good chatter around themselves. They can build a really good I influential movement. The one that I'm the most surprised of is Chris Brown. He beat Rihanna up. <laughs> then, I know it's terrible, it's, but I know where you're going. Yeah, Go it's ahead. terrible. But I don't know if he's just too, it's too irresistible or something. But he comes back with a couple of songs and everybody bam, forgives him. Everyone forgives him, and you just love him. And he didn't beat up like a no name. He beat up like I know one of the like the modern the best day looking female artists out there yeah, too. It's just it's crazy. It's some people the ability for them to bounce back is is amazing. Yeah, I think some people have a certain resilience. I mean, in many ways, Trump when he ran in sixteen had that. You know, they kind of have that Teflon on them a little bit where they can do no wrong. People have romanticized for years about the mafia and in in in. in that stuff i think 
people find romance where they want to find romance in terms of marketing or appeal and they're willing to overlook certain things you know maybe things that people get wrong and i think if you're open about all your faults it works to your advantage too i think and i think he gave a pretty poignant apology and i think people bought it because he's he's a very charismatic guy and i think he tried to move on from it yeah uh you know and i don't know what that looks like for him but she was pretty beat up i don't know how he got that (laughs) fucking pass but yeah i mean some guys just have that teflon on them but it is you bring up an interesting point now media's getting crazy out there and the amount of fake information swirling around everything how do you create a brand like yours and sift through it all to be stay competitive and not get swallowed up by the media machine that's so quick to say this isn't acceptable because of this or this is canceled because of that how do you walk that tightrope do you just say i don't give a fuck or do you actually pay attention to it as a brand and say well we don't want to be canceled we got to appeal to this one or that one it's a dangerous tightrope i mean how do you navigate it um so i think I'm pretty lucky in terms of uh, coming from a comedy space. So when we built our brand, our fitness brand, it has always been like a side hustle. Mm. So it wasn't something that like my livelihood or me feeding my family or whatever was dependent on it. So we were able to take certain decisions that may slow the growth of it couple times backwards sure but it was perfect and right for the growth of the actual company and a lot of people they don't have that luxury you know Mm -hmm. where if they're going to grow the business they're like okay we i maybe i don't even like this person but i have to collab with them because it's going to be good for this or yeah the brand or this move um you know actually this product isn't really part of our core values for our company but i think we need to launch this because so many people have been asking for it so they're kind of already kind of i guess uh not not like uh, ruining their integrity, but they're being more flexible with it. Mm-hmm. For ours, since day one, it has always been like our, our motto is dominate humbly. So we try to crush it as hard as we can. We want to, uh, but remain respectful and humble and always keep like, as much as we try to train our ass off, we want to stay very grounded and very down to earth. So we've just stayed that way. And I think because of that, our fans and our customers, they really love us because they can feel the authenticity right and we're just lucky enough where the bills don't have to be paid by the revenue of the brand you know? right yeah. it's tricky because you watch a brand like nike you know when they support colin kaepernick they eat shit and it's hard when you see <laughs> but but you know they can take a bullet or two because yeah. they're nike yeah you have less room for they, error they got you know they can they got lots of chatter yeah. yeah they can you know they, they don't have the funny money they got the real shit they but they can take a bullet when you're a young brand and you're starting out, it's now it's it's crazy because you you say something the wrong way and everybody's like, "See, yeah. I told you." And what's even scarier is you could say something the wrong way four years earlier, right? You know, because you're like, "Wait, but that everyone was talking like that, or that was acceptable at the time." And now you can say something just, you know, they could pull up the, even the past. Yeah, but you're a comedy guy. And I have a theory, and I've said it a few times. I think two things. I think Biden being the invalent that he is, I think is, <laughs> well, no, like, listen, I think it's going to become funnier for the media. And it's a comedy question. Yep. And I think it already is. We've already seen SNL spoof him. I, I think it's becoming more a funny, more of a story than I think maybe certain groups would like it to be. And I find it interesting. And I do think he's going to be a more appealing story in the comedy str- he's too irresistible to ignore yeah comedically yeah. right uh, um, some of the highlight clips that i just see of him just saying rant like the i think most recent uh, he, they are funny i yeah, mean it's fucking the hilarious. most recent one he said he was a vice president for 40 years <laughs> and they killed his daughter for something <laughs> and i'm like what the hell's going on i don't even know this yeah. is crazy yeah. it is becoming an irresistible comedy story but i was gonna say i think i see a lot of like what bill maher is saying and I think he's going to be the bridge and he's going to be the line of where I think, because comedy is being threatened right now. Yes. Yeah. Very seriously. And I want to, I want to get your take on it, but I, I see some of the things Bill Maher's saying and he's like, I mean, what are we going to do? Cancel everybody? Like, you know, yeah. it, I think it has to reach it because you can't even go on stage and do a bit anymore without like somebody being like, see, I told you, you know, there's no boundaries. How do you deal with it? One of the things that I really liked that Dave Chappelle said was um, comedy is the last pretty much like venue and platform for freedom of speech right because you have people coming out and it's supposed to be sketch paper you know we're going out and you're sketching and you're and you're saying random things and and you get audience feedback sometimes you're saying things maybe you don't even believe in but you want to see how other people feel about it because you're playing with thoughts playing with words 
And once you get that audience feedback and it's been uh, battle tested, then you go, okay, cool, that's a bit. Mm. And, and I understand now you kind of draw the sketch in pen or permanent marker or whatever, right? But in this day and age, everything is being judged as if it's permanent marker and the ability for people to sketch is no is no longer yeah. around and that's a huge problem because if everyone has to be perfect on their first step everyone's going to be scared to make a mistake and really innovate or do anything you know or have any like really innovative thought because it's going to take a bunch of uh uh falling and and figuring it out and so for me i think like when, when, when it comes to freedom of speech, it has to be all of it or none of it, right? That's mm. that's the whole term. And with comedy, you should be able to go as dark, as crazy as you want, understanding that we're just all sketching or everyone's sketching yeah. here. And if it doesn't resonate with you, it's not the comedian's fault. That comedian is just probably not for you. you right. Know? Yeah. I agree. And I wish it was that simple. But I see, you know, I see some of the things Bill Maher is provoking in the conversation. I don't agree with everything he says to everybody listening. I'm not, you know, a Bill Maher. <laughs> but I, I do agree with some of the things he's pointing out because I, I do think cancel culture was going to run its course because, I mean, I hope so. You, you could cancel everybody. I mean, you really could. Yeah. And, and do I think some people got away with one through history sure do i think some people um maybe got a pass on certain things like we just talked about chris brown sure but do i think history will judge everybody absolutely and i think it's a dangerous thing to try to instantaneously judge someone like you said for something maybe they said five years ago or seven years ago they could be a different person they could have been an alcoholic then they could have been going through a bad divorce or a bad situation they could have just said something that they don't even know what they were saying does that mean there should be no accountability no but i think you know kind of gotta relax everybody one, one of my, the favorite things that um kevin hart did was they pulled up a tweet that he said and he was like you know what i apologized for it once I'm not going to do it again. And that was the year that he declined hosting the Oscars. Right. And hosting the Oscars was something that's like on the top of his It's a bucket. big deal, yeah. yeah He's like, I want to do this. It's such a big thing. And it, it almost kind of like uh, solidifies anyone's legacy in Hollywood that you've done it. And for him, he was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deal with this bullshit. And I really um, admire him for that. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of guys are stepping up. I mean, my theory on it is you can't acquiesce. Just own it and move on. Say, yeah, at that time, this is, and let everybody judge based on that. I think the guys who try to acquiesce and be total apologists, and I'll use that word in front of it, total apologists. What's the difference to you? So to me, the difference is your gut. If I said in my past, I don't agree with abortion, for example, mm -hmm. okay, because I believe that it kills a life. And let's say that abortion goes out of favor, you know, that position goes out of favor. I think people should understand maybe where you were, where your thoughts were at that time, or maybe why it resonated with you at instead of just judging in that pure moment. Now, to answer the question, I think when you absolutely try to be an apologist, your gut reaction is immediately, I need to apologize for this. Mm, I see. So I don't think your gut reaction should be, should be necessarily to apologize, although Kevin Hart in his situation, the what he said dictated an apology. I think you should people should be willing to say, hey, at that time, this happened to me, X, Y, or Z. That was why I felt the way I felt. I'm sure you all understand. Yeah. It's not... Uh, it, it, it's about being being responsible, but you're not guilty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see? Yeah, I get it, you. There's a responsibility, but not everybody's guilty. Yeah, not like self-proclaimed guilty immediately, and that's your knee-jerk reaction. A hundred percent. I mean, I have tons of friends of multiple, as I'm sure you do, multiple ethnicities. One of my best friends is black. One of my best friends is Cuban. One of my best friends is Asian. Yeah. And they'll all tell you, the things we say behind the scenes, we'd be canceled for 55 All times. Time, 55 yeah. times, Bart. <laughs> yeah. It's like when people say, I can't believe that guy drove drunk. Yeah. You know, like the Henry Rugg situation. Everybody's driven with a few drinks in them 99% of the time in life. If you went to college, you definitely did. Yeah. I'm not saying Henry Ruggs was not wrong. He was terribly wrong. But I've never done 156 miles an hour when I was drinking. Yeah, yeah. So most of the time most of us would a level head or a brain, you know, that that had happened to you. You'd hope that you went five miles an hour or walked. I Which do, even walking is dangerous. Yeah, I do wish that there was an extra level of empathy when it came to like cancel culture. Exactly. Because man, we're all human beings. We all make mistakes, and we all make very similar mistakes. Reasonable. And, yeah, and when people get canceled or get judged for things, it's almost as if they're doing it with a hundred percent clean record. But yeah, I think man, like that's how people get divided. You know, if we can have a little bit more empathy and be like, yeah, I've done that before. I've done everyone, almost every circle I've ever been in. 
if you take any of their conversations out of context, mm. you get canceled. Like the John Cena thing comes to mind as an absolute apology. He had a Freudian slip. Yeah. What, uh, what was the... We, we said something. Taiwan's not yeah, a country. Not a co- yeah, a country. he didn't acknowledge Taiwan yeah, 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 as a yeah. country. You know, I mean, look, anybody could have made that mistake in that moment. Yeah. Did it warrant a national apology? I mean, he could have sent a tweet out. Hey, you know, I, I've never visited the region. I'm not 100% yeah, familiar. Yeah, yeah. Like, give me a pass. But like they're probably his, gonna pull like a sponsorship. Or yeah, something like his like gut that. reaction was immediately to run to the gallows and say, "Hang me," you know. And that's yeah. that I think is a little extreme. And the fact that he had that reaction should tell you all you need to know about why people have to PR things the way they do now. Yeah, which is kind of scary. It is scary. Uh, I mean, I do have some friends in Hollywood, and uh, when you see them like answer interviews or answer questions for like magazine pieces. Their PR person's right there. Uh, uh, edit that. Uh, no, you want to say this? And I'm like, wow. What's crazy is the amount of closet Republicans there, too. That's yeah. a fucking crazy. <laughs> That's it really crazy. is. It, it's getting weird yeah. because it's like a whole underground society now. And, you know, and then then we had the shooting situation. With, with, what's his, I didn't even bring that up. That was crazy. Uh, did you see that? The shooting with... Um, What's his face? What the hell was his name? Uh, oh, Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin. Yeah. Sorry. I always want to say the other Baldwin for some reason, Billy, because he's the one that cracks me up, the yeah. weird one. Yeah. But Alec Baldwin's crazy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mm. mean, uh, that one's nuts because uh, now I think they're trying to take all real guns out of movie production. I think they should. I mean, I think they have for the most part. I mean, I think they use mostly blanks, blank pr- guns that are prepared for blanks and yeah. you can use certain magazines that only accept blanks yeah. and stuff like that. This particular scene was a revolver scene, which I know in some cases is hard to do, but I mean, every part of it, there was malfeasance involved, but most movies now either use an inoperable gun or they use a blank gun, you know, and yeah. there are very specific stuff you can do that make it, what we would consider non-operable or non-traditional you yeah. know i mean you can remove a fire and pin very easily you know how it's yeah. not a hard thing yeah yeah so i i'm a proponent why why do you have to use real ones you know just yeah. get a prop studio you know prop them all out i mean my favorite guns are all movie prop guns yeah i mean i mean you know true. yeah yeah so i i'm i'm quite okay with that i do i want to do i want to see lasers in every movie no <laughs> no you know what i mean i don't want to see bad cg either i don't yeah, want to see I, badly done like muscle flare yeah i don't want to see that either. no 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 i agree with you there but at the same time i think you can do a reasonable practical effect you don't have to have a wheel gun with real live 45 in it you know and that yeah. was a terrible situation but I mean, being on movie sets, I try to explain this to people because a lot of people were chiming in, you know, he should be hung, this and that. I go, you don't understand the amount of indemnifications you sign on a set like that, especially one that's going to have stunts. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's his fault. He's responsible. And I know he's going to pay a lot. Yeah. You know, do you think it's also the armor's fault? I think they, they said 100%. there's like live rounds mixed in. Where he can be held accountable is he was a producer on it. Oh, that's where they can get him in accountability but but to everybody i know there was a lot of people that like uproar he should be arrested now you know what it's like on a movie set i know the amount of indemnifications you sign when you do a deal th- there's a lot and it's going to be very hard to get him in a criminal capacity yeah but in a civil court he's going to pay out and he's going to pay a lot i mean for sure in terms of like the closet republicans do you find that it's weird where i felt like maybe even in the 80s or 90s cancel culture was that of like a republican thing where it's like oh the rap mccarthyism lyrics. Yeah, yeah like rap lyrics or pop culture oh look 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 at look at what they're wearing it's so provocative and it's crazy how it's completely shifted where now it feels like republicans are fighting for well, the freedoms yeah to answer your question i i will say this I think the left has shift, shifted incredibly left. And I think one of the faults of the left, and I've come out and said this many times, is their inability to put people into boxes. Okay, so one of my big issues, and I grew up in Massachusetts, is traditionally Democratic, uh, Kennedy era politics, you know, but Kennedy running today, he'd probably be a Republican. I think so too. Yeah, I it, think it, the modern day Republican would be a Democrat. Of would be, yeah, day. and I think what's happened is the left just has an, in, like, as a guy who leans to the right, I would always say, you know, that's a racist. Like, we're not talking to them. If You know, that that's not good. We draw a line. We, create, we have boxes like The Shining. We draw a line. The left doesn't draw any lines. It's wide open. If you want to spend a trillion dollars on trees, they're like, come out. You want to open the borders? Come out. The problem with all the left's plans, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out, and I, I would think smart people in L.A. would start to figure it out, 
the problem with their plan is they want to take everything away, but police everything, but control everything, but take it all away. You can't demonetize police and seize guns and expect military to be behind you in these decisions when they're dis, you know, they're disavowing almost any military acknowledgement whatsoever in this country, especially the left. And they want to basically turn everybody into soy eating, you know, eco car driving, you know, people. And the reality is there's still a bedrock of this country that believes in protecting our natural resources, our borders, everything else. And there's a failure to even acknowledge that. And that's part of the fear. Yeah. You know, the left doesn't want to even acknowledge it. Yeah. What I think it's also crazy is that that we only have two choices, you know, where I feel like most people that I know, there's like on both sides that they kind of like pick and choose what they want. And I almost feel like if there was a third choice that was kind of more in the middle, uh, that would they would almost win the majority vote like every single time. I think in the end, it all boils down to money. And I think money, influence and power. And I think you have a lot of the old bedrock, the Nancy Pelosi's, the hundred year old Chuck Schumer's. They have so much control and so much money that they're just happy with how it's going. Mm. They just want to maintain any way they can yeah. the discord yeah, yeah, yeah. because they're making money on it. It's kind of like the longer I can, they're like, the longer we can milk this thing, the better. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think that's what you have. But I also think that that's a baby boomer generation thing, Bart. And that's why I said in the beginning to you, the 55-year-olds are the hardest people to talk to. It's because the disconnect from us at 30 and 40 years old between us and the 50 and 60-year-olds is so wide. It's a chasm a million miles long. Go up to any six-year-old, ask them about TikTok, ask them about streaming, ask them about YouTube. They are going to look at you like you have 10 heads they're not even going to be able to wrap their head around it. So you have this huge chasm and this huge disconnect, and we're seeing the rise of the celebrity president. But unfortunately, the baby boomer generation is hanging on to power so tightly, they don't want to let it go and pass it on to the next generation, and they're squeezing every last bit of it that they can. Yeah, and that's I almost, dangerous. I almost feel like politicians should also have a term upper, limit. A, 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 yeah, term limit and also upper limit, mm. where that way you kind of, or maybe there's a balance of some sort, like in the military, right? Like you have um, your officers, and they call the shots, they're the one that signed the papers, and they're generally a little bit younger and slightly more educated than their enlisted counterparts. But it's that for a reason, where you have your advisor, your senior advisor, who actually knows the logistics of getting something done, almost like the blue collar perspective of what's happening. Mm -hmm. So that way, when you're in the white collar position, you're not signing random things without a reality check. And with these politicians, I don't know if there's that type of checks and balances, or if they're even in tune with what like uh, you, what the modern state you've of mind been is. around celebrity the problem is and you've been around influence the problem is when you get in those rooms with those people and i know you know what i'm talking about everybody in there's powder in their ass uh, yeah, everybody's yeah, yeah. in there telling them how great they are like no one's gonna tell alec baldwin anything he's doing is unsafe yeah, you need a true. strong person to do that and there's very few people that can walk in a room and have no influence by that stardom and is willing to say what's on their mind or be a true advisor. Yeah, that's true. Because your your next job or livelihood is dependent on that person. Yeah. And you're going to do a lot of bootlicking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's there's a lot of that. And I know you've seen it. People just, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why they say some managers, you know, they get the, the, the rock star lifestyle. They, they feed it because it keeps them on the road, keeps them happy, keeps them making money, but it's really killing them. Yeah. You know, and you know, obviously people are becoming more educated now to what's important and what to take care of. And there's just more information out there that it's harder to, it's getting harder to do in the entertainment world because people are getting robbed left and right. People are signing bad contracts, bad deals. And a lot of that is perpetuated by the ability to take advantage of people. Yeah. For better or worse. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think, I think as long as that exists, people are going to do it and it's too tempting not to with some. And I think politicians do it in the worst ways. So do you feel like the divisiveness that we're experiencing and then people wanting to hold on to power, like career politicians, it's inevitable. It's just going to keep going that way. Yeah. I, 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 I think it's in our lifetime, we're going to be fine. But I think you're going to see an erosion of people's rights and you're going to see an erosion of, of people's uh, basic understanding of what they should have the right to do. And we're already seeing it now, you know, that, that erosion of like, it's not okay to say no. We can uh, almost see the future of America in, in even some of these other countries. Yes. Where yes. Uh, I think I saw an uh, uh, article in, our, in um, Australia where there's people protesting the vaccine mandates and then 
the cops are just taking clubs out and they're just beating them. Yeah. Like, get out of here. You can't even say that over here. Like, like, it's not okay to say no. Yeah. And that's what's going to drive a lot of this. Yeah. And I think the, the ability to silence. Now, what I think can save it is a different story. I think what can save it is I think social media should absolutely be subject to publishing laws. I think everybody on social media should have a blue check mark and be verified. I don't give a fuck what anybody tells me. I know people have different opinions about that. I'm tired of seeing fucking four, two, three, two, one C three PO account. And, and people are okay with that. If you want to talk shit, talk shit under your name. And I think if you do have a brand or you have a company, you should have a blue check mark as well. I own this. Da, da, da. And then that'll clean up the streets, so to speak on social media that way people are held accountable how held accountable and i think they should be subject to publishing laws and that will force facebook and force youtube and force some of these entities to take a long look at what they allow to be successful if you catch my drift yeah, yeah. what's uh what are some of those publishing laws that you think so what they can say is what the, what congress could say theoretically is they could say similar to like a publishing house like random house or mcgraw hill or any of these places they could be subject to what they publish could be held to held, held liable. Oh, so to lawsuit right now, they don't have necessarily those types of, it's like a free forum. Yeah. You know, people could say what they want. So they could spin the story however they want. They could spin yeah. it out. Like, like when we see in our Instagram posts, this is subject to COVID-19 based on what? Based on some COVID-19 advisor in Instagram. What are they basing that on? Yeah. So there's a lot of like this, like they were just saying the other day, the fact checkers may be biased, like no shit, <laughs> right. you know, yeah, like yeah, they yeah. may be biased. No kidding. So I think that will clean up the street level really quickly. That's what I think. And I think people will be less to, likely to talk tough from a fake name and people will be less likely to spit some shit. And that's not, I'm not talking about doxing people. I'm talking about you just use your name. Yeah, he's being accountable. Just be accountable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think people running around being able to hide behind whatever allows them to do whatever they want. Yeah. So you feel like social media has allowed the keyboard warrior to kind of all come out, be way more vocal, and mm -hmm. then kind of uh, been able to be a lot amplify. more powerful, yeah. amplify, whereas if they weren't behind the keyboard, then people would watch what they say a little yeah. more. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that would, that would have an immediate impact. I think if you would have passed two laws, those two would have an immediate impact. Yeah, I think uh, for me, like coming into, so I'm 37. Um, I've lived most of my life without social media. And then coming into a place or into a generation where there is social media, for me, I don't know if it actually makes my life like have a net positive. And I always like feel like if I ever get to a point where I feel like I've reached retirement and... I'm set for myself and my family. I think that would be the day that I probably just delete my social media and go back to a flip phone just so I can contact the people that really matter in my life. I think that's the best outlook to have. Yeah. I think it's hard for a lot of people and a lot of people don't detox from social media enough, which is a whole nother story. That's a whole separate podcast. Yeah. But I, I think people need to take the proper time every so often to just get away from it, get off it and not take it seriously. Like yeah. I never read half the, half the comments. And I know that sounds terrible, but guys, there's only so much time in a day and you only have so much bandwidth. You do the best you can to, to get back to folks. But the reality, I mean, I'm not going to bullshit anyone. It's, you can't go through it all. Yeah. And you try because you want to support everybody, but you can't let the stuff get to you either. There are times you got to put it down and you got to prioritize what's important to you. So of for me, like me and my wife, we have a rule. As soon as it's uh, 5 p.m. and later, it's family time, and our phones are like somewhere else. They're on the counter. They're not even near no. us, not even within hands reach, and it's family time. It's me, my wife, and my son. We watch TV. We do all that stuff. If there is an emergency, because my business is social media-based, if there's an emergency that happens, one of my staff will have my number. They'll personally call me, and I'll check in to make sure everything is okay, but outside of that 5 p.m and beyond there's no more you got yeah you gotta have a system like i mine's more like if i go out a lot of times like i was at a dinner friday night with some friends you won't see any pictures of it on social media i was with some people i don't publish a lot of that my phone goes in my pocket and i'm there to enjoy the night with my friends yeah. now you know when we're out excuse me People will be like, hey, let's take a selfie. Let's do this. Let's do that. I have no problem with that. I'm just not the first guy to grab my phone or check every message. So from probably 6 p.m. that night to about 10, 30, 11, when I get in, no social media. The fights were on Saturday night. I'm sure you watched them. I you know, watch the there. fights. Yeah. We'll talk about those, but watch the fights. <laughs> my phone was away. You know, yeah. I looked at it halfway through, buddy. You know, hey, did you see that? Oh, yeah. Hey, 
throw it on the table. Like you said, I, I try to use certain activities, not necessarily a time as a way to say, I don't need my phone for this. Yeah. I'm good. I also feel like um, people that have been able to brand their social media, like Tony, uh, Real World Tactical, I think it's actually a healthier way because yes. you're almost using social media like a video game, yep. right? Like this is my character that I'm building online mm -hmm. and that's it. And 100%. Also, and, and, and that way I can live my personal life. There is this detachment. Whereas there are people that put 100% of who they are online and I see them venting, talking about all kinds of stuff from uh, dogs dying to, you know, like how the this dead flower on the side made them feel and <laughs> the all chicken that. Chicken sandwich they had at lunch. Yeah, all of that stuff. And if, if, you're, if your validation is external, that's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really hard to continue and, and live up. It's to like understand. I know this can sound corny to some people. It's like understanding your love language. You have a social media language. It's like yeah. understanding that. For me, there's always a little bit of like sarcasm laced into my social media. Like yeah. I'll post a picture. I'll put, just put something up. I don't post a lot of like when I do jujitsu because I go there and I just go to have a good time. That's awesome. I go to relax. You never find a picture. It's hard to find. You will find one. It's hard to find. Or you're getting tapped out the whole time. The whole time. <laughs> the whole time. Begging for forgiveness. But yeah. I try to keep some things private. So mine's more event based. Yeah. And I just like to like tone it down, put the phones away. I've also done a lot. I know this will this will make sense to you. I've also done a lot to myself mentally conditioning myself to be more present yes in situations yeah and that has caused a change in it and and when you get to some of the places and things that we've had the luxury of doing in our lives and, and participating in some some things with some really cool people you really want to be present yeah i think uh you know these this day and age the go-to like sign of boredom is hands in the pocket pull out the phone yeah. whereas before i used to be Oh, talk to the neighbor that's also in the waiting room or, you know, or like take a look around what's outside, taking in, taking everything in. But now it's just immediately go to the phone and it's, I just feel like we're losing uh, more and more in touch with our humanity. And that's also where a lot of like this depression and I think sadness comes from. It's part of the reason why I started the podcast. So you can connect with people. Yeah. More human. So we can put the phone away because I feel like I felt I felt like this, Barton. You may text me in a week and say I'm fucking nuts, but most people text me after and they say, and you've done a hundred of these. It's really good to have that conversation. Like I enjoyed that hour. Like it, it grounded me. Yeah. Like I'm so happy we did this on a Monday because for the rest of the week, I'll be like, I had a good conversation. I had one. Yeah. You know, and I and I think that counts for something. Yeah. Versus a comment battle. Back Ver, and forth yeah. And versus stuff. like, I, you know, fuck you. And I'm going to send you 10 gifts and everything else. It, it just, you know, I yeah. think having that little bit of a connection, just like you said, the waiting room, the elevator, how are you? You know, it, it develops you as a person. And I feel like people are losing that and they're not, they don't have the ability to talk things out because of that. It's always discord, discord, discord. Yeah. It's zero to a hundred. Yeah. Or even like some of the, the comments or reviews I'll see on Yelp where they say like uh, they weren't satisfied. And I'm like, did this person actually ask to speak to the manager to see if they can do a better job? Because most businesses, they do try to put their best foot forward. Of course. And if you're not satisfied, they can't wait to earn a loyal customer. But unless you're Cox Cable and everybody who follows <laughs> me knows that. But That's go ahead. true. Uh, yeah, all cable companies always get a bad rap. But um, <laughs> yeah, but like in this day and age, it almost seems like people can't wait to feel like they're the victim so they can go and post yeah. this crazy story. And I'm like, man, it's, it's so terrible. I, I agree. I mean, I look, we've all done it a few times, restaurants, certain places. You, you, it's okay to have a bad experience, but you're right. Most of the time, the managers will go out of their way. Yeah. Are there times where that doesn't happen and you have an issue? Sure. But I think losing the ability to have a structured conversation or at least not honing that skill, just like lifting a weight, just like doing anything it hurts you. It hurts you. I know it hurts you in the boardroom and I know it hurts you in life because we still have to have the ability to have a structured conversation or we're going to get nowhere. Yeah. I mean, nowadays, like it's pretty extreme now where I see even like, um, like social media couples when they break up, Oh, when they break, when people break up to me, that's a personal thing, right? Regardless if it's people put their whole fucking relation. It's ex great. Exactly. I actually just had this conversation the other day with someone. I'm like, very few couples can pull that off. Yeah. And I, and I, and I, I, I caution men and women friends when they tiptoe into it, they're like, oh, I'm just going to, I had a great day. If you want to do that, that's great. But you're putting a lot more out there than I think needs to be. Your profession of your love online is not the answer yeah, all the yeah. time. 
yeah like i see uh when people break up between um couples or even platonic relationships like people that aren't friends anymore i'm like these are personal Battles. issues mm -hmm. that need to stay personal and private and uh when they air all of that out i'm like man this is this is just not good like we all have that on our own we don't listen to everybody listening we all have that on our own we don't need that from you keep it you know like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. just keep it and that's the truth like we everybody goes through some shit you know and and i get it if you lose a loved one or something maybe you're going through something you need to ask for some time you might say hey guys i'm taking a five minute break and i get that but I hardly put anything that's remotely personal. I just post the show. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that I think that's actually really And I agree good with too. you what you said about Tony. I agree. Yeah. I like, mean, I think that way, like creating a comic book almost is what comes to mind with him. No, not so much a video game. Creating he also like a, looks like a video yeah, game. Yeah, I think it works. And I think that's, you have to understand that you're a brand. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have a personal page, make it private. Have your 50, 100. If you have more than 50 or 100 personal friends, Oof, you got, we got to talk to you about circle, you know I mean? But yeah, I think that that's the way to do it. If you want to have a personal page where you want to put your kid, your cat, your dog, your this, your that. And I'm not talking about stories. I think stories are somewhat acceptable, but I think people do get out of control with it. Yeah. You know, you see, you can see some people, they get like three divorces on their fucking Instagram. <laughs> I mean, who wants to see that? Yeah. Your you Instagram know? is also technically like your track record too. Yeah. So if you have three divorces and it's like, hmm, maybe you need to stop posting those things. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you need to retool <laughs> that thought. Maybe you need to start posting, uh, going to like therapy and then getting <laughs> these figured out before you jump in and jump into relations with people. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. I think that makes sense. What about <laughs> <laughs> therapy? <laughs> where do you, where do you train, uh, train jujitsu at? Uh, I go to 10th Planet. Uh, out here mm -hmm. in... Because there's a couple locations, right? Like Henderson and downtown. Do you train in the downtown? Henderson. Or, uh, Henderson? Yeah. Why you want to go? Oh, yeah, I'm down. I just started jujitsu a month ago. Okay. And uh, I train out in uh, Cobra Kai in the Southwest. Oh, they're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we brought... Um, our Ski. Yes, with Ski. Uh, they do have no Ski classes, but we were looking for one mainly for a kid. Mm -hmm. And then so we checked out three of them and we just like that kids program the sure. best. And since and ever since we started going there, when me and my wife were going to start training, we're like, oh, we'll just train here. We like the family environment and we kind of like the whole community thing. Like if there were to be barbecues or whatever, then it's just, you know, it's a cool martial art. Yeah, it's for really sure. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's like a little bit of a cheat code, but now everybody knows a few things. So, you know, it's everyone about, knows a cheat code. Yeah. It's like six months of getting your ass kicked before you know one thing. And then you realize you still know nothing. And then yeah. it's another six months. I've been doing it for a while now. And it's it, it, it takes a toll on you. You definitely will get every limb snapped off your body. I like seeing more fitness people do it, though. I think it's really cool. Uh, there was an interesting podcast recently. It was on The Fighter and the Kid. And I think uh, Bradley Martin was on it. Yeah. And they were talking about him getting in these celebrity fights. I don't know if you caught it. It was kind of interesting. But but Brendan Schaub was really good about like letting him know, like, nah, dude, like, they'll freaking kill like fighters are still fighters yeah yeah how do you feel about all these uh like almost seeing this huge transition in what was people fighting for the title mm -hmm. and then those numbers are almost getting eclipsed by like these big celebrity style fights now well i think in the end it's all going to transition to celebrity stuff we talked about that as it relates to the fitness industry and as it relates to any other industry i think ultimately did let's put it this way the days are over of just being a champion is enough. Yeah. It's just, that's now to everybody listening. I do think eventually the talent will come up as the social media influence becomes more important because at the end of the day, you, you have to have a presence on social media to sell the fight. So do you feel like social media is here to stay for almost every industry? Yes, absolutely. That is crazy. But eventually what's going to happen, Bart, is the t like, like you see this now with this, with, uh, uh, Jake Paul I almost said Logan Paul but more so Jake he's actually becoming a pretty good fighter and he's yeah. actually fighting a fighter yeah, he's coming still, up yeah the Tommy Fury he's going to fight Tommy Fury if he beats Tommy Fury then it's showing that you can be social media famous and have some talent I'm not saying the kid's fighting for I'm not saying he's fighting for a championship or anything, guys so before somebody twists what I'm saying out of context but I think we're seeing where an up and coming fighter like that's training right now, that's maybe 14, 15 years old, that 10 years from now is going to be somebody. That's the person we're watching in those viral feeds that's like jumping rope and hitting the bag and they're yeah. like 12 years old and we're like, God damn. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because that was happening anyway with Floyd Mayweather. He was just doing it in his dad's gym and in his uncle's gym. Yeah. So he was doing it anyway. Social media just didn't exist then. So you'll see a lot of these guys come up that have the talent and the following 
to ma- eventually. It's going to take time. It's going to take about 10 years. But I do think it's here to stay. Did you watch the, uh, which fights did you watch this weekend? Both the MMA All one and the Canelo one? Mm-hmm. Were you at the Canelo fight? No. No, I wasn't. I, I, I was home. I watched uh, I watched the UFC. I went back and forth between the two. I, I watch all the UFCs, no matter if they're pay-per-views or not, and I, I get them all, and I watch both. Uh, I loved the UFC card. I thought it was a freaking amazing it, card. I thought that was... I think that's going to be the best card of the year, in my opinion. I think it's the best card of the year, and I also think that it had three of the best fights of the year. Yeah, and I thought it was crazy they opened with the Gaethje Chandler fight. That oh. was insane. I... The smart money was on Gagey the whole way. And I'll tell you why. I think Chandler came to the UFC a little late and just missed his window. I think had he got here a little bit earlier. You think he's a little bit past his prime? That's the, the way, problem. From the way he knocked out Dan Hooker from the other fight, I was like, man, this the guy problem is, is explosive. Though, Chandler and guys like even um even Frankie Edgar, yeah. they're just taking too much damage, uh, Bart. I, yeah. I, I just, those fights, they're taking too much damage. And like Frankie, I don't even know how he gets in the ring any. The last three fights he had were wars. Yeah. You know, and you just can't take that kind of damage. He's been in nothing but wars. Yeah, yeah. it's just hard. And MMA is one of those sports where that type of damage, it's just going to add up and, and trying to make a run at it will be hard. I loved the Rose Namajunas fight. I thought roll, running that back was the right thing to do for the division. Yeah. I thought, get it out of the way now. You know, don't sugarcoat it. Get right back in there and, and run it back. They both didn't disappoint. Probably fight of the night, in my opinion, yeah. or close. Yeah. I think she, Rose had, there was never a time where I thought Zhang was winning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was never a time where I thought she was winning. Did I think Rose was beating her? No, not until the end when she showed she out cardioed her. She had a mount. She was starting to do some damage to her. But I think Rose and Valentina and, and Amanda have solidified themselves as three of the most dominant champions, if not the three most dominant champions in women's history. Women's history. I wish the translator at the end, uh, they found a better translator. But I speak Chinese. Mm. So what Zhang was saying, she said that she tried her literal best this time. And last time, like, she didn't feel like she could really showcase uh, the type of fighter she was. She said this time she put everything out on the table, and Rose is just a much better fighter than she is. And mm-hmm. I just thought that type of humility was huge. Because you just never really hear that. You know, like, it's usually, I got this excuse or that excuse. Mm-hmm. Like, one of my favorite fighters growing up is Tito Ortiz, but he's also the king of excuses yeah. all, all the time. There's always, my shoelaces were untied for that one. I got a haircut, and then I was bleeding from here. And um, it's cool to just hear someone say like, yo, I, I gave him my all for the last six months and this guy was just better than me. Yeah, I, th- I, think, I, I, I think that Rose, first of all, I know some of Rose's training partners. So I'm choosing, like Rose trains very, very frequently with Valentina. So the last couple of years she's been sparring and training with Valentina. That's obviously going to level her game up incredibly, incredibly behind the scenes. Yeah. So I think Rose is starting to become just a cut above. Does she have finishing power? Yes and no. She has knockdown power, but you know, you don't see her as like doing a high level something, you know, choke or Dars or hitting a flying Kimura or something. She's going to continue to dominate that division for a while, I think, in many ways, and give people fits because she's not afraid of losing, and she sure as shit ain't afraid of winning. Yeah. So that's going to make her a dangerous person for a little while. The The Gagey fight was amazing, and I think it's Gagey's time. Uh, I really... You think he takes Poirier? That's a tough one. Huh? It's a hard one. I think him and Poirier is the, the fight, though. Yeah. I think him. And, I think everybody knows it. No matter how it plays yeah. out, him and Poirier is the fight. Yeah. And I think people have been saying that for a while, quietly. I think that's the fight that needs to be made. And I think they should ice Gagey for a little while. And I think it should be him and Poirier when the time comes. Because I do think Poirier will take care of business. But you get other guys in there creeping and lurking in the shadows. So let's see what happens. Uh, I really enjoyed the Covington rematch. I thought that was a good rollback. Yeah. I thought they did the right thing bringing that fight back again uh i think kamara proved he's the champion i mean i had kamara as like a a slight favorite i do like colby's game plan better this time i thought he played a very conservative game plan he got cocky at the end and got caught and that's what cost him but i don't think he would have been able to duplicate that yeah i'm a big uh usman fan i Mm. I just think he has underrated very underrated i just i just think he has the mindset of a monster like you've seen him get dropped by gilbert burns and he comes back out and pretty much jabs his way to a win and Mm. knocks him out so his just championship uh mindset and his ability to come back from adversity is crazy colby covington really earned my respect this fight 
Because, man, I think if the if it was a sixth or seventh round fight, I don't know who I would give it to. It would almost seem like every round that came, he got better and better. And I almost feel like he was kind of shy the first two rounds because he did get beat the last time. So I don't think he turned it on. But as he got comfortable, you just see him come out and he was landing more and more mm. shots. And I'm like, oh, shit, this is really close. The problem with Covington is he doesn't have that knockout power. We've never known him to have it. Yeah, he does, He's not someone that's going to hit you with a, with a three piece and you're going to be like, oh, shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's going to hit you with a couple shots and he's going to shoot in on you and he's going to beat you with cardio. And yeah. that's how that was his game plan against Usman both times. I think the difference was this time they went to takedowns more. Yeah. which I think was a good idea for, for Colby because he could showcase his wrestling. He could showcase that he could get a takedown. And against Usman, that would probably win the judges over. And here. he got the first takedown yeah. on Usman in history, yeah. which is And crazy. they didn't want to give him credit for it, but in my opinion, it was a takedown because yeah. he did get back control and he did get control. Granted, Usman popped right up, but what, do they, what did DC say? You go to two knees, it's two points. You know, like DC is an Olympic wrestler. He also coaches high school wrestling. So I'm like, if th if he says it was two points, that's two points. Yes. Yeah, that's 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 crazy. That's I mean, I'm no world class wrestler, but I've watched enough wrestling and grappling. He got a clean takedown on him. Did he did he win the battle and have control for an extended period of time? No. But you're also talking about the two best in the world. Yeah. So what were your what was your favorite fight of that night out of those three? <sighs> Roses. I gotta give it to Rose. You know, I think I think you know, I, you can't overlook these women's divisions anymore. Yeah. You just can't. And there's no easy gimmies. Everybody's tough. And I think Rose and Whaley's... Gagey's right there. Gagey's a hard one not, not to give the nod to because I thought that was a world-class battle. Uh, but I think Gagey just... I mean, another fight where, like, at no point did I think Gagey was losing. I yeah. think, you know, I, I know that's hard to say because Chandler caught him a couple times. A couple times, yeah, he wobbled but, him. I was but like, I wow. felt like Gagey bounced back and was like, pap, 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 you know, throwing yeah. that little pitter-patter at him and just kind of hitting him and peppering him with some shots. So I just have a hard time, you know, putting that in the top. I got to give it to Rose, man. I, I just, that was a great fucking fight, and she proved something. Yeah, and the, I think the the true winner of the entire night was uh, Trevor Whitman. Like, his whole oh, team. Oh, yeah. You know, Justin won, Rose won, Usman won. Like, he's got to be probably coach. He was coach of the night for sure, maybe even coach of the year. Yeah, he was undefeated. Yeah. That, I mean, I don't... I, did he have anything on the prelim card that could have lost? I don't think so. I don't know. I, don't I know, know he's also one of those coaches where he really keeps his... Uh, athletes to a minimum so you can really focus on them so i don't even know if you yeah would. the coaching game in ufc is still very wild west to be nice i think there's some evolutions it has to go through to clean itself up like you still have quite the mix but att guys like trevor whitman certain people are really starting to dial it in and consistently putting a good product out there and starting to develop good systems for their fighters and i think that's the future of it and that's really the key if they can just figure out the management piece i think it'll go a long way you train striking too? No, just jujitsu. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't see. For me, I, I did judo for a little bit. I oh, did sick. karate as a kid. Yeah, I did jujitsu. I've done jujitsu for a while. I I enjoy those. I enjoy it. Striking and stuff like that. First of all, never plays well. I mean, it's you know on camera or anything. So it's good to have. I would tell everybody out there, have a combination. Have something. You know, at least know how to throw a one two and move your head a little bit and at least know how to tuck your chin and understand those things. And I know I'm paraphrasing a lot, but you got to know those things, even if you're going to wrestle or do jujitsu. Yeah. Just to, uh, you're talking about just in terms of self-defense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least know, know the basics. Nobody's saying you have to be a world-class, you don't have to be fucking Leon Spinks, but you know, at least be able to move your head a little bit, maybe throw something, but you see a lot of wrestlers, they just use kind of like that overhand right before they rush in and they have a system. And if you're really good at takedowns and you're good at stuff like that and hitting submissions, do you need striking? Is it necessary? Like on the streets? Yeah. Do you have to have it? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I, I like, think you needed uh, to manage distance. I like Jocko's take on it where he says, because uh, I think a lot of the questions he gets is, why jujitsu uh, for the number one uh, form of self-defense? Because he was like, before you guys get into a, some sort of hold on each other, you're, you always have a choice of running. Mm -hmm. And he was like, so in terms of physical conflict, that should be your go-to. Your, your, your go-to shouldn't be, I'm going to be a hero today. It should be, I'm going to try to avoid conflict at all costs. But if it arrives at your doorstep, now you got to be comfortable enough to 
you know, take care of business if you yeah. have to. And the reason I lean towards non-striking martial arts, it, it, there's a couple reasons. Because whenever you're in a physical altercation on the street or somewhere, chances are it's going to be close or you want it to be close. Uh, there's reasons for that. There's a, you know, you don't want someone who maybe is in a parking lot or somewhere to go grab a glass bottle, anything like that. Distance can be your best friend and it can be your worst enemy, depending on how you manage it. It doesn't mean to say striking is not good. Just on camera, whenever you see someone throw a strike or hit a blow, you always, you don't see what comes before a lot. And in context, it can kind of get lost. Yeah. I think you have to have it, but do you have to piece everybody up on the street? No, you can <laughs> use, uh, there's other ways. Yeah. To hold somebody down. I'm not saying striking is not a part of the plan. It, it's got to be there. But I think if you just train in striking, you're at a bigger disadvantage than if you just train jujitsu. Or you can grab a hold of someone and kiss them on the cheek and freak them out. Too. And free, yeah, a hundred percent. I agree. I agree. Listen, we, we've gone for an hour and 20 minutes. I got to get you out of here. Wow. I know your time's sensitive. Fast. I know. Uh, listen, you promised to come back one day. Of course. I'm, I'm a Vegas local now. locale so yeah let me know yeah no i'd love to have you back and we can go deeper on some stuff crazy times let everybody know where they can find you how they can reach you and how they can get in touch um if you want to check me out on instagram that's bart kwan b-a-r-t-k-w-a-n if you want to see what my fitness brand is all about go to barbellbrigade.com and those are the two main places to find me and eric and everybody and daryl's been sharing the links and and thanks steph and everybody who put the links out there go check out bart's stuff go give him a follow i i really appreciate him coming in and and we have so many mutual friends we'll have a lot to talk about over time hopefully he'll come back hopefully he likes it here i we'll love see. it I'll, I'll come i'm gonna come back just to hang out do, do, do. so listen i want to thank everybody who's in the in the chat and i want to thank everybody who listens please leave reviews i do a terrible job asking for them remember to like and subscribe on youtube go check us out everywhere podcasts are heard and remember the sponsors pulsar right on optics uh of course volkwartzen firearms that special thanks to scott and uh gallo technology rhino metals and blackwater ammunition galco leather holsters enforced weapon lights and sigzauer appreciate all you guys can't thank you enough we're gonna head out <laughs>